Okay, um, well, folks, um, we're quoted here. I'd like to welcome you to the September meeting of the uh, Euro Committee. Um, we are to be joined by Claire, um, Claire, but she is having a broadband delivery, so hopefully they will be resolved shortly and she'll be able to join us. Um, the, so we have the, we have the quorum of members and it will be seated appropriately. Uh, the meeting will include today will include a briefing from the, the Northern Ireland Business Brexit Group, a written briefing and discussion on the ETS common frameworks and considerations of an ASR. At the end of the meeting, we'll move into the closed session to discuss the legislative programme and EU exit preparation and delivery. Um, Morris, John, and Patsy and, uh, are, are on the star leave here. Claire will be joining us as well, hopefully, when she gets her broadband uh, issues resolved. <coughs> And John has let me know that he will need to leave the meeting around 11:30 a.m. Uh, the committee will be the meeting will be broadcast throughout Parliament Buildings and online. And I welcome you to use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and they are muted. Um, we don't have any apologies. Um, in terms of minutes, the meeting was held on the 30th July at pages five to seven. A note of the informal meeting on the 2nd of July, pages 9 to 14, and the draft plans of the meeting held the 21st of August are pages uh, 15 uh, 16. Are, are people okay with those? Agreement? <coughs> yeah. Okay. So the next, yeah. Uh, try. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next matter I have here on the agenda is um, I want you to refer to the memo. Uh, the memo from the clerk at pages 19 to 31, and a briefing from the NABB WG on the 32 to 40, alongside a further paper at pages 3 of the table papers. And I want to take this opportunity at this juncture to welcome Bea Starleaf, Aidan Connolly, uh, the director of the NA Retail Consortium, Michael Bell, executive director of the NA Food and Drink Association, and Leslie Aston, the chief executive of the Ulster Farmers Union. And I would like to take the opportunity to invite the members to give their um, presentation and then uh, follow the briefing, members may then wish to ask uh, a question. So, okay. I can start if to check in shortly here. Yeah, we got them. Good morning, Good morning Aidan, Michael and Wesley. Good morning, Good morning, Good morning Chair. Good morning, how are you? Um, so I say I'd like to welcome you to Starleaf, and I'd like to um, invite you to give your uh, presentation. Okay. Um, thank you very uh, much for for the opportunity to to talk to you today. Um, I think uh, can I just put on record at the at the start of this uh, my thanks to uh, the uh, the clerks uh, uh, in 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 the committee um, both through illness and, and through other issues. I was like the Scarlet Pimpernel to pin, the, to to, uh, to, to pin down. So I'd like to thank them for their patience uh, above anything else. Um, I uh, obviously I'm the director of the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium, but I'm also the convener of the Northern Ireland Business Brexit Working Group, and that was set up um, around the end of last year, whenever the withdrawal agreement was going through um, the uh, through Westminster to try and get some some amendments and trying to pool our our concerns. Uh, on on, uh, on on what leaving the EU would actually mean for Northern Ireland business and, and for Northern Ireland consumers. And since then, um, we have put together several papers. We have had uh, meetings with everyone from the EU to uh, the, the, the uh, Michael Gove, the, the, the Chancellor of the Duchy of, of Lancaster, the Irish government, and, and, and everybody uh, in between. Um, Recently, the um, UK government brought out their um, command paper for what will happen with Northern Ireland um, after the end of the transition period. In response to that, um, we put together um, 67 questions in response to that command paper, the majority of which have not been answered. Um, Obviously, Wesley and, 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 and Michael, um, you've got from farm to fork here, uh, literally, um, and, and they'll be able to, to go into their um, particular areas of, of expertise. But when I'm working with, with retail, um, one of the things that I was very clear whenever we started off on this journey um, it was that this wasn't just about the retail industry. Um, this was about the Northern Ireland consumer. In fact, our Brexit campaign was called the Fair Day 
for consumers. Northern Ireland consumers have about half of the discretionary income of Great British households. Um, at the moment, it's £215 per week that's left over when all the big bills are paid in Great Britain. Here in uh, Northern Ireland, it is um, uh, £119, so just, just, just about half. That means that we uh, can't, as a community here in Northern Ireland, afford cost rises that come with corrections. Neither can the retail industry afford it. Um, we're very high volume, very low profit margin. So even uh, small amounts of um, uh, cost increases can have a, a severe uh, effect on, on, on the bottom line. We're still asking for lots more detail um, from the, the British government, from, from the Westminster government. We're still asking for a lot more uh, generosity of spirit and movement uh, from, from the EU. We have always said that there's a very simple equation in this. If the uh, new costs are higher than the profit margin, then either the product or the business model becomes unviable. Up to this point, we have been talking about um, what products are going to be unviable. Now, there's a lot of retailers, there's a lot of other businesses, even our suppliers, who are looking to find out whether or not, um, uh, not what they have to implement, but whether or not they have a working business model uh, come the 1st first, first of January. There has been some good news as far as the Trader Support Service, um, which is, is great. It's finite. It's great, but it's, it's good for, for, for that very short time frame, and it does help with customs and, and those customs procedures. However, it does not do everything that is needed, and we still have some uh, really big concerns. For example, the new customs system, the VMRS system, will not be ready to be rolled out and better tested until November. That leaves us about six weeks. Um, to get it up and running for each of, of, of the retail members from, from the biggest to the smallest and every other industry as well. Um, we have huge problems, um, and I know uh, Michael shared this as well as far as, as, as labelling is concerned. Usually, labelling, uh, if you're changing something on the 1st of January, you have the label signed off and starting to be printed in August. So we are already behind. The closer we get to the deadline, the more it's going to cost to get ready. And quite simply, we don't even know what needs to be on those labels um, yet. We don't know about things like VAT um, and how that's going to work, um, dual accounting, and, and, and again, more friction. Friction equals cost. The biggest one for us, though, bringing food in and keeping uh, people across Northern Ireland fed is export health certificates. Export health certificates are needed for things like uh, products of animal origin. Basically what this is, they're fit for human consumption. Here's the provenance and, 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 and they're good to go. Um, those at the moment cost about 200 pounds uh, in, in, in GB. We would need over 200 per load. All of the loads, over 90% of the loads that come um, for uh, retailers in Northern Ireland are composite loads that means they're made up of lots of different items and not one single item and you can have up to three four hundred um, products of animal origin each of which will need a separate export health certificate so you can see that that is huge amount of cost unless we get some sort of solution some sort of derogation from the eu and some sort of technical or other solution uh, from uh, the uk um there are some other things that, quite simply at the moment, you cannot even get an EHC from. So, for example, um, things like seed potatoes, um, some things like types of flour, which we don't actually uh, make here, and Michael can go into that in, in, in greater detail. Um, uh, things like uh, prepared, non-frozen prepared meats, so things like mince, things like, like, like sausages. Um, and when you're talking about um, uh, these sort of things, um, it's not just about the, the cost. It's about overall affordability, the cumulative burden on the Northern Ireland consumer and also the choice. You've got to remember that we already have um, between 12 and 18 hours less shelf life than they do in Bolton or, or Birmingham, quite simply because there's longer to go. But if there is delays because these, this paperwork is not done properly, it's not the fact that you have um, missed uh, uh, a, a, a ferry by 20 minutes. It's not that you even get the next ferry. Because of the way that retailers work, you will have missed your picking day for the day. That means that a store will go out without whatever's there. That could lead uh, to things not being on the shelves. And as we've seen, 
um, through this this COVID uh, uh, situation, that can lead to severe shortage problems very, very quickly as, as, as word of mouth goes on. It has highlighted that just-in-time supply chains are hugely efficient. They're hugely time efficient, they're hugely money efficient, but they're hugely fragile as well. I'll leave it there, but just to, to finish off by saying that um, we have a, a, a lot of, of things that need answered in a very, very short fr time frame. Um, and I think um, the, the, the only last thing to say is that as a working group, um, should it be from the, the biggest guys right down to the, the FSB and, and, and all of our other members, we're committed to working together to make this work. It's not the best situation for us, but we will continue to fight on and, and bring these messages to whoever needs to hear them. Thank you, Aidan. Okay, thank, thanks, Aidan. If, if I could maybe come in uh, at this stage and suggest that Michael actually come in next because of working from consumer backwards, uh, leave me to the end as the primary producer. So over to you, Michael. All right. Uh, thank you, Wesley and Aidan, and thank you, uh, committee, for the invite. Um, I think uh, this is a huge subject. Um, I have a presentation uh, about this, which is entitled Know Your Onions. And the reason it's called that is like an onion, this has layer after layer after layer of complexity. Um, every one of them uh, has the potential to bring you to tears, quite frankly, um, at the disruption to business and trade that it could engender. Um, if I start with uh, a plug for a paper, which both UFU and NIFTA have endorsed, which is the UK Food and Drink Building a Path to Recovery, um, this sets out a lot of the issues that Brexit will flag and that have been exacerbated by COVID. Um, to contextualize what we're going into, the eating ecosystem, which is a, a phrase that I champion because you cannot disaggregate food uh, farming from processing, from retailing. We are part of one system that supplies food to the consumer. That system is currently very challenged by COVID-19. Um, there is a bit of a misperception that uh, everything is as normal. It is not and significant parts of the industry are under significant strain. Um, and indeed, we saw the Minister for Agriculture have to step in and rightfully uh, help farmers recently on exactly that front. Then we have Brexit, where, as Aidan has, has correctly outlined, we have more questions than answers. Um, and uh, indeed, just yesterday, I got another one, Aidan, which will be new to you. It was new to me, and that is nutritional labeling. The UK format could become illegal in Northern Ireland on the 1st of January because it is not uh, accepted in Europe, depending on how the deal plays out. So this is just another one. We already have separate veterinary marks agreed. We will become UK brackets NI, close brackets, and foodstuffs in GB will be GB marked. Uh, so we're going to distinguish between food from Northern Ireland and food from GB. Um, another point I want to make is there is a perception that this is just a Northern Ireland issue. It is not. Any GB supplier supplying food into Northern Ireland will effectively now have to become a European exporter to supply the five largest members of Aidan's who operate in Northern Ireland and in fact throughout Ireland and GB. Um, so this is going to affect trade uh, throughout uh, these islands. Um, I think in terms of specific problems, there are problems in flour, there are problems in red meat, uh, there are problems with many facets of labeling. Uh, and the principal thing that we need at this point is some degree of clarity. Um, and that clarity is already too late, as Aidan has said. Many foodstuffs that we produce are mostly very short life and very fresh uh, and very high integrity from, uh, it has to be said, mostly family businesses. Um, they are, by nature, very fragile. 
because they have to be fresh, they have to be short life, and they are limited margin. Uh, but we also produce some foods which have longer shelf life, uh, six months to a year, and those are already packaged. Those are already sitting in warehouses, getting ready for Christmas. And the last comment I'd make at this stage is, if you are to do the biggest change in living memory to the agri-food system, Christmas is the worst time of year to try and do it. Okay, thanks, Michael Chairman. If I may come in at this stage, then just just uh, square off the circle from our point of view as a supply chain. Uh, from a primary producer angle, our key focus, although we do have issues in terms of uh, movement of goods from GB to Northern Ireland, our key issue is movement of goods the other direction, NA to GB. So the whole discussions around trying to get clarity on definitions such as qualifying businesses, qualifying goods, transit routes to GB, whether it's direct from north through Northern Ireland or a transit via the Republic of Ireland from, from Dublin into England. All these questions are as yet unanswered. Uh, we did have meetings collectively with a uh, joint uh, customer consultant committee that HMRC and Treasury have set up uh, on the 11th and 12th of August around both the business guidance and also the uh, trading service um, support service. Um, but having said that, we have had nothing really since. Uh, we understand legislation is obviously put in place to guarantee unfettered access for NI into GB before the end of the year, but this is now the beginning of September and we're still on the clear on that. Uh, so I think there's certain issues there. There was also the UK government's very short consultation uh, on the operation of the internal market, which again we had lots of questions about and obviously had interaction with the protocol uh, being the key one, but issues such as you know, non-discrimination and uh, mutual recognition are key issues going forward and again uh, you know it depends how those all play out. Uh, I think over and above that then uh, in terms of not only the GB market um, but also how Northern Ireland will play its role in future trade arrangements will it be via the UK via the EU um, and uh, how will we interact with, with those going forward and again that is unclear as, as we speak. Uh, certainly, the president, if you and myself are involved in various government, uh, HM, uh, sorry, Majesty's government uh, uh, groups, whether it's the Trade and Agriculture Commission or Trade Advisory Groups, uh, which are now getting involved in discussions around standards of imports and trade deals with third countries. But again, it's at a very early stage. And in all of this, I haven't actually even mentioned tariffs yet, um, because tariffs are a very big issue. And depending on the sort of trade deal that the UK does with the EU and indeed with all the third countries, uh, that would have major issues for Northern Ireland because uh, we have to make potentially have to collect tariffs coming into Northern Ireland, which would be part of Europe, uh, and actually may get rebates on these things. So again, that's not clear, and the definition of an at-risk product has to be resolved uh, as well. So there's lots of issues there, uh, and I think that's probably enough for me at this particular point in time to, to set the scene as, as the final piece of the jigsaw. And across to you, Chairman. Then. Um, okay. Okay. Um. Thank you, thank you uh, Wesley, for that there. Um, th thank you all the three years for um, that uh, presentation and for uh, this morning's presentation. Um, do you see the? Um, I just want to pick up on something there. Um, you, you made reference to the um, Twitter support service, Aidan. I think it was yourself that made reference to it. Um, could you just elaborate on that a wee, that a wee bit, and specifically, um, I'm suppose what we're concerned about is that. If there was some sort of a trusted trader um, scheme came in here, I know we talked about the, I think it was a green channel was referred to in the past. Um, that would benefit obviously the bigger supermarkets. But can you think what? You think would you be concerned with implications for maybe the smaller businesses who, who wouldn't be able to benefit or employ or take on consultants or Brexit uh, specialists? So they're. Um, <laughs> The, the trust of trader and the, and the, the uh, trader support service are, are, are two different um, things. So the uh, trader support service is for anyone, including uh, and, and especially aimed towards um, smaller uh, guys. So what it means is that um, there is uh, two hundred million pounds plus one hundred and fifty million for technology um, to remove um, the need for customs procedure. So basically, it will be a free at point of use uh, customs uh, system. Um, and, and they won't, even the small guys won't have to do all the, the paperwork, all the all, all that sort of really bothersome um, custom stuff like finding tariff codes and, and, and all that sort of thing. That will be done for it. Now, that is finite and that is only for, for two years. 
and there is a, a, a need um, for building of capacity. Um, should that be for um, you know the, the the big guys have never done this before? It's you know they're not importers um, and and as such are exporters as such. Um, when they usually get stuff, it is uh, already duty paid and and all the other good stuff done. Um, so uh, for everyone, this is a, a, a brand new world. So the the trusted trader scheme is is again something separate the trusted trader scheme is um and we can't really use the, the words trusted trader um because it means several things to several different people what we've been trying to say is an auditable certified supply chain um with a green channel and i know that that sounds a bit semantics but it, it's it's to try and you know the, the 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 trades people are probably screaming at this every time they, they hear a trusted trader scheme because there are things like aeo authorized economic operator schemes which are in place which is a trusted trader scheme that's not what 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 the, the government's looking at um i suppose what they are um what what they're looking at is firstly to keep the um, the, the populace fed for all those things that we don't actually grow or, or make here in, in, in Northern Ireland, which is, is, is quite a bit. Um, so that, that was a key priority uh, for them. So what they're trying to do is they, the 70% of the value of everything that comes from Scotland, from GB to, to, to Northern Ireland is for um, retailer shelves. And the thought process then being that firstly, it keeps people fed and clothed. Secondly, it allows then for um, freeing up of the ports. There aren't those delays for other people. There aren't, the, you know, there's an ability to deal um, with other things if the majority of it, the, the stuff that's not seen at risk or that can be certified and auditable is removed uh, from, 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 from the process. Now, what we have been saying, um, because actually we haven't seen any detail from, from the government on this, in the House of Commons yesterday, in response to a question by Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, um, the Secretary of State outlined slightly more about this uh, retail solution. But that was the, that's the most that we have heard of it. We haven't actually had had any of that uh, details. So we look forward to, to seeing it. But what we have said is that you know if there are people like uh, who who are supplying. Um, you know, not just the retailers themselves, but if there's people who are part of that supply chain, then then we can look at it being widened out. This isn't about you know cornering a market or trying to get an advantage. This is about trying to make things continue to work. Our, as I said in, in, in the presentation, our priority, and this has always been a fair deal for Northern Ireland consumers, and making sure that there's the same affordability and um, uh, and choice for them. What I can say as far with the Brexit working group hat on is that we've said from the start that it's no uh, industry or no sector left behind uh, and that's a key principle that we stay, that we will stay to. So if there is something that, that, that comes in on, on one side, um, we'll very much be pushing to make sure that there is uh, a, a, a wider solution that, that, that uh, suits everyone's needs. Thank you, Eden. Um, I'll, I'll actually I'll pass around the members here. William, you indicated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and can I thank you for your presentation. And as has been said already, there are a lot of unknowns in this hall. Given that possibly negotiations could go to the wire on this, and maybe no, no one knows what way this is going to end up at the end of the day. Will it not be almost vital that there's a further lead-in period, like? Things just can't change on the 1st of January uh, and say, look, we're just changing everything like that. I think it's vital, and I heard it mentioned in the past, that there has to be a six-month lead-in period. Is that possible, or is that going to happen? I think there's the, the problem with this being that it is... Uh, above our pay grade. <laughs> we, we can ask for it, certainly, but it, it's up to the EU and the... Uh, UK to uh, decide that um, it cannot be done unilaterally because for all intents and purposes we will be administering uh, administering uh, the new customs code and the single market regulations. It's not up to the UK to do it uh, unilaterally. Um, there was a chance of a transition period. I think there were trans or, or, uh, an extension to the transition period. I think the word extension uh, sort of left a bad taste in in, in, in someone's uh, in a lot of people's mouths. Um, I think though you're absolutely right. If you look at what GB is able to do and what it has done is that sort of phasing in approach over six months of, of the different changes, which it can do unilaterally. We we don't have. 
uh, we, we don't have that ability. I think, um, honestly, I do not care what you call it, should it be transition, bedding in, adjustment period or whatever, um, but even given the, the labelling um, that, you know, that both myself and, and Michael mentioned, the fact that there's, you know, usually it takes four or five months to do uh, labelling changes, um, really, uh, we, we would need something to cushion this blow. Change is going to happen. We are leaving the EU. This is all, you know, this this is happening. Um, I think it's just if we had a cushion or a parachute or whatever way you want to call it to, to make it uh, a bit easier, it might be useful. But that's going to be up to the EU and the UK to jointly agree upon. Uh, well, I would have thought it, it's very important for both the EU and the UK to come to some arrangement because I think it given that negotiations may run to the wire and it could, maybe December before we get final, finally see what the colour that's all going to be, uh, I would have thought, I would have thought a drop off the cliff to the 1st of January will not work. I don't think, it, I think it's impossible. So uh, uh, I would be hopeful that uh, there'll be some sort of a lead-in period. Uh, that I think there has to be, yeah. Um, is there any view maybe from Wesley or... or, or Anyone else on that uh, issue? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, you raise a very good point. Um, I think all of us, um, uh, certainly NIFTA, we've been working incredibly hard, both with uh, London colleagues and indeed Irish colleagues, to try and get some clarity on this. And I'm sure the same is true for my colleagues. We've been doing that individually and collectively. Um, if I give you an illustration of just one tiny example, uh, members may or may not be familiar with ISPM 15 pallets. These are pasteurized or heat treated pallets and the purpose of them uh, is to stop uh, infections and uh, creepy crawlies coming in on those pallets. They are mandatory by law coming from third country into EU. They will become mandatory in law coming from GB into NI. There is currently not uh, a capable supply of those in GB. There's currently about 600,000 and the demand is expected to be uh, more than a million. So there is a, a very good example of uh, something that's cast in law. Uh, we do have clarity on. They are going to be required. They will not, by the way, be required for Northern Ireland goods going to GB uh, because we are effectively exporting out of the EU. But um, how is that going to be complied with when they simply physically aren't there come the 1st of January and we don't have derogation? The other comment I want to make on this is um, I encourage the committee to view NI to GB and GB to NI as part of an equilibrium. Uh, Aidan's members supply uh, on a big store about 30,000 SKUs or stock keeping units or individual products. Uh, my members supply about 4,000 of those. And the balance between goods in and goods out is very important because it uh, drives logistics costs. It drives our ability to export uh, Wesley's members excellent products, which we've put in packages to the good folks of GB. Um, so there's, a, there's an equilibrium here and a disturbance in that equilibrium will affect both directions. Um, so. There needs to be um, an overview of this, this complex system, uh, and I know that's uh, time consuming to try and get on board. And again, my, my very final point on this piece is, we do not want frictionless at the cost of integrity. There is a balance to be struck here between maintaining a robust, high integrity system where we can guarantee to our customers, Aidan's members, uh, that there is uh, legal and proper uh, and high integrity and high quality food um, and not introduce a set of derogations which are unmanageable uh, and create problems uh, which would damage our reputation and indeed uh, damage our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland's pr uh, reputation as well. Okay, um, thank you, Michael. Uh, we'll bring in Patsy here on the Starleaf. Patsy, you're down to ask a question. Thank you, everybody. And um, very much good, Aidan, um, for, for your input there. Um, you're all your extremely valuable good work on this issue. Um, 
regularly we have to call upon yourselves for informed opinions and I have to say that's what we get. Um, probably as we're talking about extensions and lakes now, uh, those that call for taking back control are finding out that controls can be elsewhere and uh, that's just all I'll say about that. Um, the, uh, if we could just maybe explore some things because there, there are issues around the edges that, that I would like to find out about which maybe some of you haven't mentioned like for example, um, an integral part and for the likes of, say, Wesley, so some of the materials that are coming in here are coming from the EU mainland, right? Um, that that feed into, literally, um, the, the agri-food sector. And I'm just concerned about that, uh, or to get maybe a bit more information. The second thing then is, and another key element of the agri-food sector, is labour. If there are any attendant issues which have been flagged up or, or flushed out there and the third thing i'm glad michael brought me into that because i wasn't going to to uh, uh, raise it necessarily within this but it has major implications for it and that is the, the high integrity and high quality of our food sector and that's um i'm moving slightly but it has major implications for ourselves that's any implications or protections that have been sought by yourselves from the the UK around the integrity of our food markets and our food qualities, particularly whenever they're engaging in uh, a trade deal with the USA. Hmm. Uh, I suppose if I take the one on trade on, on the US trade, didn't get that out of the way, and then you take the labour one because that affects you more, Michael. Yeah. On, the, on, on the US one, um, uh, so, you know, there, there's the horror stories of um, chlorinated chicken and, and, and hormone beef and, and all that sort of thing. Um, it has to be remembered that as we administer the EU single market, then those rules will not uh, apply here. Th those, those new um, uh, products will not be able to come here because we are looking at, uh, or we, we are making sure that we can't actually uh, bring that in because it, it goes against what the EU is, uh, says. Um, the other side of things is that um, on, the, on the adverse, that means that there could be, if there is cheap chicken, cheap beef co coming in, that actually will affect Wesley's guys more because that's the complication. Mm -hmm. rather than the actual standard. So the chances of it coming in here and having ill effect on our consumers is very, very low. The chances of it having a competitive disadvantage for Northern Ireland farmers, if there is cheap stuff flowing the UK market, yeah. that is, that's where the, the big yeah. problem is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd jump in there if I may, and, uh, uh, and, and members. Uh, the threat of reducing the price floor in the GB market is a bigger threat than Brexit itself right. in terms of what it could do to our effectively way of life here. Yeah. Um, the, the point that was has not been effectively communicated to consumers is that we have a set of policies which to date have been written by the EU which govern animal welfare environmental standards uh, and those all affect the cost of our food yeah. and we can certainly bring food in from other parts of the world cheaper on different standards but they're not the same policy costs and we haven't communicated to consumers why have we got those policy costs and how valuable they are yeah. to uh, maintaining our landscape and our animal welfare standards and the things that we value um, and I think we need to do more on that front. Um, on the labour issue um, we're, we're, we're very concerned at the cost. The government has set a very high bar for uh, migrant labour going forward. Migrant labour is a very important part of Northern Ireland food and drink processing. Approximately 50% of the workforce is migrant. Um, that mix may change going forward, but it will take time to change um, and it will take uh, support and effort. Mm -hmm. um, at the minute, the government is putting a very high bar to uh, get migrant labour and a high cost with it. Uh, and we've made representations to the migrant, uh, the MAC committee on that. Um, it, it, it is worth saying that um, agri-food is nearly 100,000 jobs in Northern Ireland. In fact, it's, it's probably more than that. 
as an ecosystem and that ecosystem is animal feed, farming, farming supplies, cold stores, food processing, food packaging. And I encourage the committee to view that, and of course retailing, I encourage the committee to view that as a joined up ecosystem and not disaggregate the pieces. Um, because um, if you look at our largest company, our largest company in Northern Ireland starts with the import of animal feed uh, yeah. and goes through many farmers before it finishes as hundreds of products on Aidan's members' shelves. Mm -hmm. So if I may bring Patsy, but before I answer your question on tracking from, from products from the EU, uh, to <coughs> pick up on what both Aidan and Michael have said in relation to the integrity point, uh, that's absolutely essential for us all because if we get this wrong, mm -hmm. then we can forget about it. Basically, yeah. at this stage, I think there's there's two things. One is the actual UK import standards. Uh, I mentioned in, in my sort of opening remarks that uh, there is a trade and agriculture commission that's been set up by the Department of International Trade um, that our UFU president Victor Chestnut actually sits on. They have a sort of a six month lifespan to produce a report by the end of this year, which goes to Parliament, um, hopefully for consideration. And there's obviously discussions around uh, making sure that the, both the, the current government's commitment uh, and what they've also outlined in their trade deals uh, negotiations going forward that they will not. Uh, lessen our standards in terms of our welfare environment. So we have to hold them to that. We couldn't get legislation through either agriculture or trade bills, uh, although the process is still ongoing. But I think certainly the, the Trade and Agriculture Commission, I hope, will, well, it, it's heightened the profile of the whole thing from a consumer point of view, a general public point of view. And we want to make sure, as Michael points out, that they understand exactly why we do what we do and the costs associated with that. I think the other one is, as well, then, is the back door that we're concerned about from. Uh, through Northern Ireland into the GB market from wherever, whether it's actually Europe, uh, where the standards are largely the same in any event and, and, and likely to be so. Um, and I think they're just concerns about what that might mean, particularly in terms of not necessarily the integrity of that market from, from Europe, but actually the volumes and the price impact that, that may have. And I know our colleagues across the water, water are watching us very closely on that front, but the integrity one is absolutely critical, I think, as everybody uh, you know agrees. Just on the point you raised in relation to transit of sort of EU products through GB into Northern Ireland, we do hope that that actually shouldn't be an issue. There are ways and means of doing that. Uh, who uh, people who, who know much better than I do, uh, you know, understand that this can be deliverable. And certainly, the public environment is in a similar position and understand that they have uh, some sort of a, a deal negotiated uh, where those products can actually transit through GB without having actually been stopped or opened. Okay. Uh, if, thank you. If, if I may make one more point, uh, just on your point on uh, an illustration of the integrity issues, organic foods are currently uh, certified by a group of bodies in the UK for UK products. So there's about five or six organizations who do that. Um, they have a reciprocal agreement with European organizations who or do organic foods in Europe. Yeah. Who, who exactly are Northern Ireland organic foods going to be regulated by on the 1st of January is currently uncertain. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you Thank you, Patrick. Okay, uh, we're going to move on round. Uh, Philip, you're next on the list. Uh, th thanks, Chair. Uh, mate, I had a number of points. Uh, most of them actually have been asked by this stage, but I, I mean, I just want, I want to thank... Uh, them for the presentation. I think it was very, very useful this morning. Uh, so it was, and indeed the uh, briefing that we, the committee got prior to the today's was very, very useful. I mean, it, it's use of actually identified the key questions for us, I suppose, uh, in, in, in our work. Uh, I mean, I was going to ask the question on immigration, but Pate has, has beat me to it. Aidan, when you were talking about the Trader Support Service, uh, I mean, that obviously it is a welcome development. But it doesn't cover uh, all the things of importance. You know, our businesses, you know, they anticipate the kind of costs of SBS checks, health certificates, the new VAT regime. You know, what what kind of a impact financially is that going to have on uh, the operation of businesses? Well, we have um, across the uh, the the. Uh, eating ecosystem, as as Michael, uh, you should trademark that, Michael. It's wonder, wonderful, wonderful <laughs> thing. Um, across the uh, the eating ecosystem, um, there has been a large um, over this past sort of ten years. 
Um, there's been a, a real drive for leanness and efficiency, which has been great for consumers, but which has been terrible uh, for profit margins. And that means that you know we're all working at trying to make as much volume as possible um, with a low profit margin to allow us to keep uh, profitable. Um, and what we're saying is that it doesn't matter whether you're uh, one percent uh, too high, uh, the costs are higher than the profit margin, or if you're a thousand percent, doesn't matter if you're unprofitable, you're you're unprofitable. Um, and while the TSS, the Trader Support Service, is going to remove some of that customs friction, um, and that will be particularly useful. Uh, for those people who are shipping ambient goods or their manufactured goods or clothing or you know that that sort of thing what it doesn't do is deal as you quite rightly um point out with ehcs it doesn't deal with with with, with that um and there, there's it doesn't deal with 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 new labeling and, and all that sort of thing so um you know the the Supply chain will always take the path of least resistance. We've got to remember that we're only 1.9 million people here, and um, we, well, our economy and our, you know, our, our communities are, are all that we have. For for some businesses, and not just thinking of retail, I'm thinking across a lot of industries. We, we, you know, I've heard it described as a rounding error. Um, so we need to make sure that we um, continue to be a profitable market for people to trade in, and for us to do that, we need to keep those costs down. Um, that's why, as the Business Brexit Working Group, we pulled together those 67 questions, and those 67 questions, the majority of which still don't, you know, there's, I think there's about 60 of them still need answered. Um, and if we don't get those answers, if we don't, uh, you know, it's, it's not just about finding out what are the new things that we need to comply with. It's about finding out if the new costs outweigh the benefits of trading here and whether or not um, you know that, that we're going to have to look at other markets for for NI produce heading heading out, or it, it, it's it's quite simply that um, unless we get all of the detail, right? And what we've asked from the Westminster government is for technical solutions and detail. What we're asking the EU for is a generosity of spirit to allow those derogations and to allow those mitigations to actually happen. Unless we get that then there are going to be cost rises and there are going to be significant cost rises. Now, until we get that detail, we don't know whether that will mean that it's prohibitive um, to either import or export to Northern Ireland. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rosemary? Yeah. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your presentations this morning. Thank you. I want to ask a, few, a couple of questions. One on the at-risk goods and another on the current... Uh, Trade deals that are going on. I'll start with the trade deals. Can you can you tell me? Can Northern Ireland? Do any of you know, or am I asking a question that nobody can answer? <coughs> can Northern Ireland continue to avail of the current EU free trade deals with third countries? Um, <laughs> so hmm. uh, we, we can continue to use the, the third country ones that are there at the moment. There's a question whether or not we can be part of. Of, um, new uh, EU trade deals and um, that is something that we're getting very mixed signals uh, about um, we're getting told by uh, the EU that that's not possible we're getting told by the Irish government that it may be possible we're getting told by the British government that simply don't know and it's up to the EU so there's, there's, there's a lot of the conflict there um, I, I think it's one of those things that again it, it, it's under the the, the, the 60 plus yeah. curtains. Um, I would assume that um, because of the competitive advantage that it would put us at, um, there will be people who do not want us to be part of those new, new EU, EU trade deals. But as such, where we are at the moment, um, we will continue to have uh, the uh, a, a, a veil of the, the, the current EU deals. It's only when there's new ones that come in. And you got to remember that there are uh, deals in the offing at, at the moment, so that's something that will need to be clarified very, very quickly. So if I make my rosemary before you move, over, move on to that risk products one, and in terms of trade deals, I think there's an issue as well about if we have non-Northern Northern Irish product, non-UK product in our goods, then does that actually qualify? And to come back to the whole labelling issue, uh, and in all of these discussions, there's another party, a third company, and they can take decisions on this. So it is totally unclear at this particular point in time. We get told by the UK government 
uh, that they are rolling over all of these existing arrangements and continuity deals. So they're saying you don't need the EU ones because you'll have ours instead. But going forward, uh, in terms of the UK deals, the EU deals, we just simply don't know. And there's a real live issue about you know labelling and, and the product mix within a particular individual product going forward, and that's anything but clear to see. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd echo my colleague's comments um, and, and almost foundational underneath all of this is, um, so we, we're not clear on the rules of, of which set of customs unions effectively we're going to apply. Um, we don't have clarity, um, and, and NIFTA has been working really, really hard on this, of what is a Northern Ireland food product? That's going to apply, that the protocol is going to apply to, and indeed, what's an Northern Ireland food business? We think we have answers to that that are workable and have integrity, um, but that's that's a, a mission critical definition because depending on the tariff and customs outcome that we end up in, that definition will become effectively a go no go for businesses, farmers, and food products. Thank you. Thank you. Um, second one is on at risk goods. At the at the moment, you know the role of the joint committee is critical in determining what at risk goods are for entering the EU single market. Now, uh, what process will the joint committee use to determine at risk goods? So this is uh, unbelievably um, uh, uh, overly complicated. Um, because it is quite simply that there is a specialised uh, committee who will feed into the Joint Committee. The Joint Committee will then uh, make that recommendation. Now, because there are different talks uh, going on at the same time, even as far as FTA, you've got to remember that if there is a free trade agreement with the UK and the EU, as far as tariffs and, and, and quotas are concerned, then actually a lot of this will go away and it's not really needed. But there's an inherent friction within the protocol itself because Article 5.1 um, says that tariffs will only be applied uh, to goods that are at risk of going into the EU single market uh, or EU customs territory. Um, but Article 5.2 says that everything's at risk until it's proved that it's not at risk. So it's, it, there's, there's an inherent friction there from, 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 from the, the first point. I think um, there, if you look at what has been said in the Specialised Committee and what has been done in the, the Joint Committee up to now, they're very much aware that this is uh, something that needs solved very, very quickly. Their hands are pretty much tied until there is more movement on the free trade agreement um, and also looking at different uh, mitigations that, that, that could be in place. So quite simply, very, very complicated. Uh, there's a waiting game going on. And again, uh, business and, and the whole eating ecosystem here uh, needs to get that clarity sooner rather than later. The longer that this goes on and the more painful it's going to be. Yeah, and if if there is no if there is no agreement, there's going to have to be some arbitra arbitration process. What will that process? What do you envisage that process to be like? Or so the, it's it's going to actually be more than an arbitration process. So the the um, before you even get to that sort of arbitration process, the. Um, uh, there will have to be, you, you will pay all your tariffs coming in to, to, to Northern Ireland Territory. So all of our guys will fill out their customs code. You know, you've got to remember that this isn't just about, here's what we have. Each of those different products will have a different tariff code, which we'll need to put in. So you're talking about new systems, you're talking about man hours, you're talking about cost. Um, if they have to pay it on everything that goes in, they then will have a, a, a system whereby they try and claim a rebate of that because they have to prove um, that it didn't go into uh, the south and was, and was uh, sold in, in Northern Ireland for, for Northern Ireland consumers. Now, on that, we don't know, firstly, what that um, process will be. We don't know how long that's going to take. We don't know what the evidentiary burden is going to be. Um, that's going to, you know, if we're waiting for the money to come back, that's going to provide cash flow uh, problems at a time when there's going to be increased costs anyway. So the, the basic process is if there is no agreement, um, everything's at risk, we then pay the tariff and then we try and reclaim it back. But there, 
that process is, has not been outlined and neither has the evidentiary burden for how we reclaim the tariffs that have been paid. Okay. So if I could just come in there as well, I mean obviously the UK government have their own position and they outline, outline that on the protocol, I'm just reading from it here, that I say it's only those goods ultimately entering Ireland or the rest of the EU are at a clear and substantial risk of doing so will face tariffs, but that's one side of the argument, one side of the negotiations. Thanks. Hey Rosemary, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Aidan, Michael and Wesley. Um, one for Aidan here. Aidan, you said that um, some products would become unviable with new costs. Would it be possible for you to give me an example of what products you have in mind or you'd be thinking of? Thank you. Uh, it literally could be uh, anything. Um, it, it's, so, for example, it, it, it's got less to do with the type of product and more to do with what the profit margin is. So, if you are um, working on something, you've got to remember that um, up until quarter four of 2018, we had had five years of uh, price deflation, um, which meant that um, for consumers, absolutely great, and um, their, their, the, the shopping in their basket was 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 cheaper. Um, but for the supply chain, um, that that competition, that sort of uh, price uh, moving the, of, of the price downwards, um, really did put pressure. And whenever I started in this industry, which seems like a lifetime ago now, um, we're talking that uh, supermarkets were sitting at somewhere around three. Three and a half, four percent uh, average profit margin on stuff. Um, now you're talking that it's somewhere around one and a half, two uh, percent. During COVID, because of some of the uh, increased costs, extra staffing, extra PPE, social distancing, drop in footfall, you were actually talking that that um, some some retailers were operating at profit margin less than 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 one percent. Um, so this this is less to do with 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 the the, the particular type, um, but it is going to be those sort of things that ha already have a very low profit margin on them anyway. So uh, not your luxury goods, but your your staples, which will actually affect um, those people who are most economically uh, vulnerable anyway, and and that's uh, particularly uh, concerning to me. Can, okay, thank you. Can I expand a wee, a wee bit on that um, in uh, if I may? There's a misunderstanding of the word tariffs when applied to agri-food. The purpose of the tariffs normally on agri-food is to stop trade. Uh, it's not simply a balancing tariff. Most agri-food tariffs are north of 20%, and the margin on food is typically, as Aidan says, uh, 2 to 3% processors, 1 or 2, 3% in retail. So the margins are not there. So it becomes a binary decision. Trade ceases with the tariff in that good. Um, I, I say some tariffs are 20%. I know of one significant tariff, which may impinge directly on Northern Ireland, which is currently 65%. Um, I don't know too many consumers who would want to pay 65% more for a foodstuff, but who would not make a decision to go something else. John Blair, calling in through spot, uh, the Starleaf here. Chair, um, thank you. Can, can I thank uh, Wesley, Aidan and Michael as well for all of the work they've done um, on behalf of uh, suppliers, consumers alike. I have a few questions, Chair, so some of which have been covered so so I'm going to ask a, a broader question. Uh, given the remit of this committee, could the uh, could, could those attendant, uh, in attendance tell us uh, what's the working relationship like with the department um, in and around these issues? Are you receiving assistance on the, the questions you've raised to try and get answers? Um, could you get more assistance? Uh, given the, the concern expressed here before about preparedness for Brexit in general, and I have flagged up uh, as colleagues have the, the lack of progress at certain times around the infrastructural preparedness. Uh, could, could you give us some insight on into assistance you're receiving, if any, from the department at both ministerial level, of course, and also departmental official level? I have another question as well, if I can go back on that separately. 
Um, if, if I maybe going to start as, as say, the, the farming side of, of, of the supply chain, the uh, Department of Agriculture have been where they can, been extremely helpful in terms of trying to help understand what the situation is. I think they, like the rest of us, are in the situation where they just don't know the parameters around which we're all working at this particular point in time. They, they did establish a thing called the Trade and Agriculture Committee some many years ago. Uh, and that met uh, on numerous occasions and then stopped because obviously there was nothing happening around Brexit. That has now started again and there's a series of meetings already scheduled going forward uh, on a fairly rapid basis. But again, there's only, point, there's only point in having a meeting if there's nothing to talk about. I think that's the concern that we have because we're all, while we're engaged uh, up to a point and hopefully more so going forward, it's very late on in the day and there's more, a lot more that still has to happen. And the Department of Agriculture will certainly be uh, involved in that process and help us along the way. Okay. I think one of the things that we need to be mindful of is that the uh, COVID-19 situation uh, took up a lot of bandwidth and you will find that when you're working with trade, when you're working with supply chains, it's usually the same people who are who would be working on, uh, on, on COVID as would be working on, on, on Brexit. Um, we've had several meetings uh, with, with the, the, the Minister, um, who's given us an attentive ear and been particularly interested in uh, Northern Ireland consumers. Um, we continue to have uh, an engagement with the department, um, uh, and that is um, starting to to ramp up again, as as as, as Wesley ha has outlined um, there. I think we have to be very clear here that there are only so many things that were that are within the gift of the minister and the department to do. There's a lot of things that we're waiting on UKG, uh, EU, uh, and uh, DEFRA. Um, and others to, 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 to come back with. Um, so I, I think um, what would be particularly helpful, I think, is um, not just for the, the department, but for the executive to have a joined up set of priorities and a joined up voice. Um, one of the reasons why we got so much traction at the start of this year as the Northern Ireland Business Project Working Group is we put together amendments that were supported by all five of the, of, of the main parties in, in, in Northern Ireland and quite simply both the UK government and the EU said that with the business community and the five parties standing together they could not be ignored. Um, one of the things that I would like to see in very, very uh, quick succession is the executive standing with us again on should it be five broad principles or five things that we need uh, to get sorted before the end of the year to protect Northern Ireland business and to protect especially Northern Ireland uh, families. Um, that's a challenge. I'm very happy to, to, to make them and it's something that uh, hopefully we'll get discussing at the next Northern Ireland Business Brexit Working Group uh, meeting. <coughs> Okay, th thank you for that. Um, the, the second question I have I've already touched on and it's around this issue of uh, supply to, to consumers. Um, whether it's a deficit in readiness for labelling or clarification that you require, um, whether it's the lack of movement or, or product, uh, 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 first of January onwards, can you give us any further reassurance, other than that, that, that you've given already, around um, where there might be a threat to our premium product from imported products if we simply are not ready to supply or things are left sitting on the shelves. Is that the gap, that deficit, where imported products could be brought in simply to meet demand at that time? Uh, that, that is a very complex question to answer because there are too many unknowns at the minute. Um, what uh, what is at risk <coughs> is choice and value for consumers. Uh, so you could see a diminution of choice and you could see on costs driven by a no trade deal. And now how, as to what product gets affected by that, you could even see the scenario where a GB supplier of a product to Northern Ireland takes a view that the Northern Ireland market has become too expensive to service because in national terms, it's a relatively small market. My members and our local industry cannot make all those products. Um, we specialize at making what we make, which we're very good at, uh, but we can't do everything. So the, 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 the loser here will be the local consumer in choice 
Um, and I go back to my earlier comments about this equilibrium between what we bring in from GB and DNI and what we send back to GB is a very important equilibrium. Uh, it, it manages the costs of lorries coming one way and lorries going back the other. And to put it into some historical context, since 2008 to today, the Northern Ireland uh, agri-food industry has doubled its turnover. We're now 5.2 billion pounds. So we are an industry that has grown successively since the last recession. Um, and, and we're contributing a huge amount to Northern Ireland. Right. Okay, look, thank, thanks for that. Okay, John. Uh, Claire, bring you in here for a question. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, um, and thanks very much, everybody, for the presentation. I think you've said I, in no uncertain terms um, the problems that we're facing in a very, very short space of time. We have six weeks, as Aidan says, um, but just a matter of weeks until this transition period ends and no clarity, no certainty in so many areas. Um, and you raise a huge amount. So I have a few questions. I want to ask, Aidan, you gave at the start there the weekly disposable incomes of households in NI compared to GB. And I'm just wondering from Wesley, is there similar figures for um, farm incomes here in Northern Ireland compared to GB? If you want me to ask that, Claire, now, yes, there are, there, there are income figures. Uh, regularly published uh, by the, the government across all the regions of the UK and typically you'll see that Northern Ireland's incomes, farm incomes, particularly because of the smaller scale of our farms, is actually less than our, our counterparts across in GB. But those, those figures are readily available. Okay, and they're on DEFRA website, are they? Uh, yes, you can get them on DEFRA website, even the Department of Agriculture would have those as well. <laughs> Would you even have a ballpoint or a sort of an, an it, 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 it depends on the type of farm that you're talking about, um, but t t typically it would be less, yes. Okay, um, so that raises concern. I know that this is all about fair deal for consumers, but, uh, and again, in reference then, you know, that the focus is really on no sector left behind. So I'm, again, worried. So if our farmers are already receiving less of an income, um, is there... So we're looking at the cumulative costs to consumers by adding, you know, all these extra um, pricing to to different with labeling and certifications and stuff. What what's the what's the impact on cumulative costs to our farmers here? Are we looking a lot for them? Uh, it, it depends a lot on this idea of unfettered access into the GB market and whether we can participate in EU trade deals. UK trade deals, uh, a lot of that's unknown. I mean, in theory, we should actually have uh, no additional costs going into GB uh, from Northern Ireland as, as our main market. So, strictly speaking, there should be no extra cost that we have to bear. But again, that's very much in the mix. We know that there already are uh, certain things that we will have to do. Uh, and it depends a lot on how our standards potentially diverge going forward as well in terms of production standards. We have to align ourselves to the EU rules. GB does not under the protocol, and again, while we're starting from the same place at this particular point in time, if that diverges, then we could find ourselves being uh, uncompetitive fairly quickly, and that's a big concern for us, but we can't put figures in those at this stage. Yeah, and you rightly raised, you know, the issue of trade deals, um, Wesley, but they're firmly within the, the hands of Westminster, um, certainly for now anyway, um, and I have to express that I have no faith uh, um, that we will not see a lowering of standards, and we're already seeing examples at the minute with, for example, the Agri and the Environment Bills working their way through Westminster, so while we're being asked for legislative, legislative consent for those, we're seeing that as they're in the ping-pong system of Westminster, we're already seeing food and environmental standards being um being traded off there before it's passed so I'm, I'm just wondering and so if we are looking at the potential for cheap imports from other countries in trade deals um the impact on that on our farmers um who are already suffering from lower incomes um how worried is the ulster farmers union about the sustainability of our small to medium farms in northern ireland um, and the impacts that they're going to be facing here if, if we get the wrong sort of trade deal with the EU from a UK perspective, if the protocol has to be implemented, and then depending on how those UK trade deals with third countries go, it could actually be devastating for us over here, um, just in terms of additional costs and actually having a, a, you know, a much more competition on the market, I think, as Michael mentioned earlier, so it could be devastating. So the simple solution for us 
is that we want the UK to have as close uh, a, a, a future trading arrangement with the EU as it has at present. Yeah. Okay, and again, my, my concern again is for the small and medium farmers because that's about the diversification um, that we have here and how vital that is um, to, you know, the the food ecosystem, or the eating ecosystem. Is that's that's true. true. Uh, but, Trademark. <laughs> but, and, and again, looking at this, you know, the volume production is key to profit margins. So if our pro profit margins are already so tight and so small for the producers and for our farmers, um, again, what's the risk then that we're set to lose? Oh. Uh, I'd pick up on some of it, if I may. Um, both UFU and NIFTA have said uh, in our recovery paper, we need to focus on three things. Uh, balance of trade and resilience, which is employment and productivity gains. The move to healthier diets, nutrition, energy balance and portion size, and integrity gains, CO2, environment, and animal welfare. We, Our customers want those things, and we need to work to deliver them. Uh, and we need a Northern Ireland plan, which is uh, cross-party and cross department you, you cannot develop a sustainable and profitable future for farming without including processing and without giving consumers the products that they want to buy. Um, and at the minute, we don't have a clear plan for Northern Ireland. We have uh, support being issued to farmers, which is, is great and is right but there's actually been some supports which are not there for processors at the minute, which really makes very little sense um, in the overall picture. So um, I think, uh, I, I don't want to put words in Wesley's mouth, but I think the, we need a plan for the Northern Ireland eating ecosystem. If I could just concur with that, because at this stage, uh, now we're leaving the European Union, uh, we do have the scope to actually uh, I suppose amend our direct support uh, su support system for farmers. Uh, now it won't necessarily be next year, but we have uh, going forward we can do that. Uh, and I think within that we have to have the context of not just on the on the primary production side, but right across the industry, including processors. Uh, and we have an opportunity here, and it's important that we do take that opportunity and uh, and try and progress um, along the lines that we're talking about. Okay, thank you, Claire. I'm not sure if you're back in, but uh, hopefully that covered the point that you were making. Good. Good. Not, uh, okay, we'll just move on. Morris. I think you might be muted, Morris. Yeah, that's me now. Yep. Thank you very much, Deputy Chair, if that's uh, the correct title to, uh, to give you yep. uh, for letting me in. Uh, most of the points have, uh, have been covered, and I'd like to thank both uh, of all, Aidan, Michael and Wesley for the, for the document they presented. But it presents more questions than answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with it. So really, all the other points have been raised and uh, covered. So I, I would just like to know, what are the implications for, the Northern, for Northern Ireland accessing the UK grant scheme? Uh, will the Ireland Protocol prevent Northern Ireland business availing of, uh, of this grant scheme? There's a wider issue on um, state aid uh, on, on this one. Um, and quite simply, um, we fall under um, the European Court of Justice um, jurisdiction for this, and we also fall under the EU. Uh, rules uh, on under state aid, and, and that's de minimis. Um, that means you're only allowed to have a certain amount of uh, government support. Uh, to, it's it's basically to reduce um, uh, or, or to stop um, uh, on to uh, competition um, by government support. Um, so the, the simple answer is we will still be able to get grant aid for businesses up to a point. Uh, but after that, um, unfortunately, we are um, yeah we, we are confined by uh, the EU uh, state aid rules. It, it's one of the things that's that that's uh, that's in, in, in the protocol. Mm -hmm. Okay, just one more question, and I hope that's, that's okay. Uh, 
What opportunity uh, is there available to be part of an, any adjudication panel or committee when it's to be decided what is and what isn't at risk goods? I think it's vital that we have local representation. What's the opportunities available to be on that, uh, that sort of committee? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't have a direct answer. Um, Others have mentioned where their office bearers are, are plugged into various parts of the decision tree. In NIFTA's case, our chairman sits on the Food Council for the UK. Um, so we, we're all trying to make representations to uh, address that, but at the minute, I certainly don't have clarity on it. As, as far as the direct decision making, um, uh, the, the, the decision making tree, as it is the, the, the process, um, the specialised committee who we meet, meet with quite regularly um, and who have uh, Northern Ireland um, representation uh, on it through the executive office um, will be advising the joint committee. It is the joint committee who makes those overarching at-risk um, uh, determinations and those determinations are uh, EU on one side, UK on the other side. Northern Ireland can have representation there but only if the eu bring ireland at the same time that is that's the way it's laid down in the in in the the the, uh, the, the protocol and the guidance to the protocol so um as far as um northern ireland ministers or or, or us having a, a direct influence there's there's nothing direct indirectly we can talk to people mm -hmm. thank you thank you uh, Debbie, I, I think this briefing this morning has been uh, very informative and vital, and I would uh, I would hope that this is not the only time we're going to hear from these gentlemen. I hope that they'll be back again when they get more clarity and more information. Thank you. Thanks very much, Morris. Couldn't uh, disagree with those comments. William, you were looking at it again. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chairman. A um, couple of things. Um, one was Michael gave an example earlier on on. on um, ISPM pallets, he did pallets, and he did say that all pallets coming into Northern Ireland goods would have to be, these pallets would have to be used. Is that on all goods, or is it just goods that's moving on into uh, the Irish Republic? No, it's, uh, I'll clarify, it's all goods that are under SPS controls. So it's, uh, those are the uh, sanitary and phytosanitary controls. Um, so it, it's restricted to that. That's mainly meat, protein, dairy products, and horticulture products. They will have to come in on heat-treated pallets. Um, as to my best of my knowledge, it's not every single product uh, has to come in on them. No, Aidan, you can uh, amplify that a wee bit more. No, he's, he's, he's absolutely right. Um, I, I think uh, you're a big, the only thing I would say is you're a wee bit conservative with your estimate earlier on uh, of, a, of a million. We are estimating at about uh, 1.3, 1.4 million of those pallets uh, will be needed. Um, it's because of the, the sort of integrated nature of the supply chains across these islands. They're sort of uh, cyclical. Um, so, for example, um, our, 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 the retailers, the big retailers, buy about 2.6 billion of Northern Ireland agri-food produce. Pro produce um, about 60% of that goes through um, the south. So you have this huge turning circle of things going to the south across the Wales and the product coming to Scotland uh, to, to Northern Ireland and, and back through. And um, it's not just enough to have uh, enough pallets that you um, use there and then. You need to have the stuff for coming back as well. So it, it's a rolling stock of somewhere around 1.3, 1.4 million of those things that we need. The, the yeah. other, just the other comment I want to make, we've been, insu we've been assured by the British government that there will be unfettered access to the UK market for Northern Ireland goods. How do you see, are you content that that will be the case? That, that argument there, William, I think why there's a legislative commitment from the government to do that, we have concern about the commercial realities, about what actually will happen, I mean, the, the guys have touched on earlier about how uh, suppliers coming into Northern Ireland will look at it. You know, if it's not commercial, it won't, 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 matter, won't matter. We're way, way the same going the opposite uh, While in theory, uh, we will have unfettered legislative access. Uh, if there's additional hassle, additional costs, uh, you know, we will, will find ourselves disadvantage in comparison to our competitors. Um, so uh, we would have concerns about the commercial realities of this. 
your um, uh, just fortuitously, your party colleague, uh, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, yesterday in the House of Commons at Secretary of State um, question time, um, asked uh, the, the the question about um, about unfettered access and and, and got um, reassurances that it's that it's all in hand. But one of the things that that Sir Geoffrey raised was the fact that there still is not a definition of unfettered access which um, both Michael's guys and, and Wesley's guys uh, can then use to make sure that their, their, their uh, products fit in under unfettered access and what even is, is a, qualify, a qualifying good. So that these, these things are, still have to be uh, settled. Um, you, you raise a good question. Uh, the questions that NIFTA has been asking on behalf of its members, and this is just a very brief uh, snapshot uh, what is the definition of un unfettered access? Indeed, what's the definition of a Northern Ireland product? How will a trader in Northern Ireland get qualifying status to get unfettered access? Um, what extra processes will a trader face if they don't have qualifying access? Would traders using inputs from Ireland continue to be able to benefit from unfettered access? Most of the food products that we make are what we would call com composite products. So they will have a proportion of local product and they'll have a proportion of imported product. Um, will there be rules of origin thresholds for businesses using inputs? Will, uh, how will in unfettered access be enforced? How will goods from Ireland and Northern Ireland be differentiated at ports in Northern Ireland entering to Great Britain? How will Northern Ireland traders be able to move their goods through Irish ports into GB? Um, th th those are all things which I, I have to say the trade association sector Certainly NIFTA, UFU, uh, Aidan's colleagues, we're, we're all um, pretty well at our full bandwidth trying to deal with these issues. Um, uh, and uh, that's a, a comment I would make. Um, various government departments, um, we, we've had a bit of a tsunami of engagement with us from various uh, government departments, which in one sense is very welcome in that we're now talking but in another sense, it's very difficult uh, for the representative organizations to deal with because there's, there's so much of it in such a short period of time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Aiden and Wesley, sir, you're bringing me into the territory that, that I forgot to mention earlier on, and that was the day-to-day the -day activities within the island of Ireland and um, you're flagging up some of those that um, see there, particularly yourself there, Michael. But what I was going to ask you was, like, we all know, like, I represent a rural community. The creamy lorries every day are, are crisscrossing the border, and uh, there's food produce coming back and forward because it's the one element of it here, whether it's milk or whether it's beef or whatever, goes to a plant down south, comes back up, processed, and maybe stored in, in a refrigerated area here. So. Um, what, what I'm trying to work through is um, the practical realities of that. Um, have you foreseen? Uh, we're talking about unfettered access to, to GB, and maybe that should have been thought through a wee bit in more detail before it even came to this point. But um, do you foresee or have you encountered any difficulties and on that, if you like, transitional stuff that happens multiple, multiple thousands of times every day? Uh, where goods and materials cross the border to be processed and coming back repackaged or whatever, that integral part of, of the economy that has developed over many years? I, I, I can answer that to a degree. Uh, the agri-food system in these islands has developed for 40 years under European rules and has formed a natural equilibrium there is approximately 800 million pounds worth north, south, south, north, and those trades are balanced. Uh, there is approximately 4 billion going from Northern Ireland to GB. And indeed, there is a lot of raw material coming from GB into NI to be processed and added into product to go back into GB. So there is a natural balance of east, west, and north, south trade in agri-food, which has been driven by given consumers the best, uh, indeed, Aidan's members, the best products that we can to sell to consumers. And, and that's been the driving force of that. This new arrangement will upset that equilibrium. 
and you're asking me how who will win and who will lose out of that and at this moment in time it's very very hard to uh be definitive about that we're obviously fighting very hard to minimize the problems for our members in northern ireland um but it's it's even affected by uh real things so for example at the minute in GB, the GB wheat harvest looks like it's going to be a record bad harvest. And that will mean that for the flour milling industry, we're going to have to pull in a lot more wheat from France and Germany. Well, that could come with a significant tariff if there's no deal. Yes. So there, there's a real world example of how things could change quite rapidly next year. The price of your loaf could shift driven by what arrangements are, are, are arrived at. I think I might go in there, Patsy. I mean, while the protocol itself, the key function of it is to actually avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. I think mm -hmm. all the points that Aidan, Michael and myself have alluded to actually show that there will be changes, uh, very significant changes in how we trade between the Republic of Ireland and here and vice versa, if all these other things aren't sorted. Yes. The, what we've always said, you know, the, if you, it seems like a lifetime ago, but whenever uh, the, we first started talking a, a, about Brexit, um, we were using the examples of things that, that crossed the border. And the, 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 the thing is, the border isn't just north south, the border's north south, east west, that's so integrated. So, for example, uh, a, a, a supermarket chicken salad sandwich would have five movements north south, east west. The humble cottage pie, which is always my go-to, um, has eight border movements, north, south, east, west, and will have goods that come from the EU, from GB, from Northern Ireland and from Southern Ireland, even down to the, the mixed milk that's for the cheese topping on it. So it's, it's the, the, you know, it, exactly what, what Wesley said, everything that we've talked about today is an added level of cost and an added level of friction, which needs it becomes an added level of cost. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I mean, that's all the members' questions, uh, and I think we're on the committee. We're all agreed that this has been very, very useful. If I could just ask uh, uh, Aidan and, and Michael and Wesley before they go, is there anything that you think might be worthwhile uh, asking us as the committee uh, in terms of how we could assist the work that you're doing? I think um, I'd very much like to um, have an informal meeting of um, this committee with our uh, Northern Ireland Brexit Business Business Brexit Working Group, um, so that um, we can go into sort of more detail and you can get uh, a, a wider sort of uh, idea of, of, of how the group works and, and what our priorities are. I think as well as that, there's going to be a need for uh, scrutiny. Uh, as far as whenever things do, and those details do start coming in from from UKG and from the EU about how things work, and um, there is going to be a need for, for scrutiny of that. And most of all, um, we are going to need uh, the committee to be a voice to um, the executive, uh, so that the executive are, are singing from the same hymn sheet when it comes to this stuff, but also uh, to the EU and, and to the uh, UK government. Um, a lot of this is uh, people are, are, are trying to place as macroeconomics about trade flows, about uh, you know percentage points. This isn't, this is, for me, is about um, uh, the consumers. Um, for Wesley, it's about farm, farm incomes. For Michael, it's about, it's about jobs and about being able to, to, to keep his members going. This has very, very tangible um, events, uh, uh, consequences for um, communities a, a across Northern Ireland, uh, and we need um, the, the the committee to continue to, to, to push those messages for us, please. If I could just add there, that Deputy Chair, I mean, I think it's what he even says. Uh, throughout this entire Brexit process, we've run on for years now. Uh, in the absence of Northern Ireland Assembly, Northern Ireland Executive, the heavy lifting has been done by businesses, by industry, and for fair play to Aidan and, and, and business group and all the folks for coming together and, and speaking with one voice. Uh, we now need, because the executive and the assembly are up and running, we now need your support and your help to deliver us, uh, the, the, you know, the one going in one direction uh, and have input that we maybe can't have. Yeah. Um, again, Vice Chair, I, I'd add, um, 
So what we've seen over the short term is a, is a number of sticking plasters to deal with short term issues. Um, we need a plan for Northern Ireland's biggest industry, which is agri-food. If we're going to have prosperity and uh, good livelihoods for our citizens, we need to build on the world-class Northern Ireland food and drink industry that we have currently. Um, and we need that plan and we need it soon. Okay, thank you. We will uh, we'll take a note of those uh, suggestions. I, I don't think the informal meeting should be a difficulty uh, and we'll work on all of those. So, uh, I mean, again, I appreciate you giving up your time to come before us. This has been really, really useful. Uh, it would be nice if the next time we meet, some of the 67 questions had been answered or with, with some more <laughs> clarity on those, but I, I, I'll not hold my breath. Uh, so, I mean, once again, just thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate that. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Come on, Thank you very much. Thanks, bye. Okay, we're just going to move on then now to item number four. Uh, can I refer members, sorry, it's the ETS Common Frameworks, the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Order. So can I just refer members to the following papers uh, in your packs, the memo from the clerks at pages 42 and 43. There's a uh, correspondence from the department on the Greenhouse Gas Emissions uh, TSO uh, at pages 44, 45, and copy of the correspondence uh, of the Assembly Business Office regarding the laying of the orders 46-47, draft order page 4070-137, the explanatory memorandum is 135, sorry, 138 to 145, the impact assessment is at 145 to 184, uh, and we also have at page 19 of the table papers the UK ETS Common Framework Summary Note. So uh, that, that's a lot of reading that we had. I'm just going to ask uh, you to take a few minutes to read the cover in the note uh, and the suggested approach at page 42 of the pack. Members may also wish to refer to page 324 of the main pack for a more detailed briefing note on the framework and the suggested approach to scrutiny. Get me uh, go, go ahead, please. Okay, so uh, members, I'll, I'll take you through an overview very, very quickly, just very quickly. You'll be getting more detail on this over the coming months. Um, ETS, Emissions Trading Scheme, the one that we're in at the minute, the EU, is the largest in the world. So it's a very common way. Um, they're all over the world. And the UK is looking at creating its own emissions trading scheme, okay, once we leave the EU. Um, emission trading schemes is a method of reducing greenhouse gases. So it's all linked to climate change. And we'll be getting more detail on all of this in a few weeks' time when dear officials will be up. But basically what they're, they're saying, it mostly applies to energy, you know, the high consumers of energy, the power stations, um, you know, that, that, those kind of things. Um, and basically what, how it works is it's the, the organisation pays for the amount of carbon it's going to use. That carbon is capped. If it doesn't use it all, it's allowance, it can trade it. And if it needs more allowance, it buys it. That's the Jack and Jill version. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that gives you a broad overview. Um, and it's what we what we, we have. So all our um, energy generators and all our energy users in the UK, including the ones in Northern Ireland, and the ones in Northern Ireland are on pH forty three. They include things like uh, Gambia Cheese, Moy Park, Dale Farm, Lakeland Dairies. They're all part of the scheme in, in the EU. And when we leave, the UK wants to have a scheme that applies to all four jurisdictions. 
So that scheme is coming into what's known as a common framework, which is going to be one of seven or eight common frameworks that are priority for DERA. That's to create a common framework that everybody inside the UK works within. So this is the new way of doing things, um, and this committee has a role to play in that. Um, the committee will be asked to uh, look at a large number of aspects of this, and again, I'm not going into any detail in it. The DR officials will be in on the 17th of September to talk to you in more detail. But what I'm suggesting is that in order to prepare for that, in order that the committee has enough information in order to make an informed decision on its thinking on this, is that you commission a raised briefing. So we get the researchers to do a quick overview for us. It'll be very quick because we're not giving much time um, on this proposed new system. Um, that we replace all relevant documents that we get onto our website and that we write out to all the ETS participants and the wider stakeholders and that we ask them to know that they're there, ask them to note that we're taking evidence on the 17th, which is only two weeks away, and that if they want to write to us with any major concerns, that they do so as soon as possible. Okay. Um, and that we will be doing more work on this over the coming months. This has to be in place for the 1st of January 2021. So, and there will be a debate in the, in the chamber on this particular one, okay, so that um, they, they can, we will be doing more work and to follow what we're doing and we can issue a tweet on it. Okay, that, that, that's a broad overview. You'll get more information on the policy and what the framework looks like and what it actually means for the Northern Ireland people who are involved in it um, on the 17th. Um, but uh, if you're happy with that, we can move ahead and start that because it'll be priority to get, to get that information out to people so that they can get time to think about it. Okay. That all seems sensible to me. Uh, do members have any questions just on the approach that uh, Stella has outlined? Yeah, well, there's only one be comment here. Uh, I read through it, and did I read somewhere that we would be remaining in the EU ETS? The, the generators, so the, the power generators, the power stations, basically yeah. will remain under the protocol. Yeah. They will remain in the EU ETS. That's what I read. And then yeah. the users of the energy, the high, 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 um, the heavy energies users, yes. will remain, will move to the UK ETS. Okay. So it's complicated. Complex, yes. It's mm -hmm. quite complicated. You know, they're going to make rules for everyone. Thank mm -hmm. you, Chair. And then the four regions and then. Yeah, okay. and they are also hoping that the UK ETS will be able to join and align with the EU ETS because the bigger market it is, the more competitive it is for trading your allowances. Okay. Not to cut the discussion short, but we are going to the officials on the 17th, mm -hmm. so if we yeah. keep the question today, just yeah. to the process yeah. rather than the, the yeah. policy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rosemary? No, and. Well, I suppose it's maybe more policy. And where do the wind turbines fit into this? Well, that's a good, it'll be definitely a question. I don't know whether any of those people <coughs> down there have um, wind turbines or not. I don't know whether they are, yeah. you know, they're clean energy, they don't, a, don't produce carbon. So this is, yeah, yeah, there's the ones that produce carbon. Mm, yeah. um, okay. I was going to suggest there as well, as the ones that have, we've listed, the stakeholders and the and the users, ETS uh, participants, that perhaps we ask, um, you know, the academic network that we had in on Brexit and the environment, yeah. we ask them to write in as well, just to get the academic yeah. viewpoint, if you're content with that. Yep, that okay. seems reasonable. Everybody happy? Mm -hmm. Okay, just moving on then to item number five on the agenda, the, the written briefing uh, on the direct payments to farmers. So can I refer members to the memo uh, from the clerk at page 186, the draft SR and uh, explanatory memorandum and correspondence from the department are at pages 187 to 194. Members will recall that the committee considered this uh, SL1 on the 24th of June, uh, at which stage the committee was content with the merits of the policy. The SR will provide a minor amendment to the rules for the application of EU regulations for the integrated uh, administration and control system, rural development measures and cross compliance for claim year 2020 due to the situation caused by COVID-19. It will provide derogations from the requirements and reduce it reduces the minimum rate of this 
on the spot checks, cross compliance, basic payment scheme and young farmer uh, obligations. The examiner of statutory rules has not identified any issues with the SR. Everybody happy? All right, yeah. Okay, well, if members are content, I will put the question that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2021-81, the direct payments to farmers, controls and checks amendment scheme, uh, NA 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Great. Okay, thank you. Just moving on then to item 6, uh, correspondence. Can I refer members to the correspondence index sheet at pages 196 to 201 and draw attention to the following. Item 1 from the Ulster Farmers Union dealing with uh, BVD infections. Uh, the UFU have requested that the committee consider this. So I'm going to ask that uh, the committee content to ask DEIRA to respond to it regarding its position on this request and whether a review of BVD legislation would be appropriate at this time. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Happy enough. Okay, then item six uh, again from the Ulster Farmers Union to the Minister regarding AFBE, Hillsborough and Caffrey Abbey Farm and Gunwari Hill Beef facilities. Uh, are the committee content to be copied into the DEIRA response to the Ulster Farmers Union? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, item seven then again from the Ulster Farmers Union to the Minister regarding the a derogation for the emergency use of uh, I'm going to just D A Q U A T. Uh, are the committee uh, content to be copied into the dear response to the UFU in this? Yeah. Be quiet. My attempt at it. Okay, everybody's happy with that. Uh, can I draw members' attention also to the update on COVID-19, uh, which can be found on page 27 of the table papers? As agreed, these updates will now be monthly rather than weekly, and uh, any questions that members may have on this update should be provided to the clerk by close of play today, uh, and then a response can be expected in two weeks' time. So, members should note that. So, also, members, uh, can I draw your attention to an item of correspondence that can be found at page 41 on table papers. Uh, this was an issue which arose during recess and involved the temporary closure of Cranswick Country, food, country Foods, and call it back in my own constituency due to an outbreak of COVID-19 among staff. So a letter has been issued to the Minister requesting an urgent response. We all seen uh, we were copied into that letter. So uh, we're asking the Minister for an urgent response and to indicate what steps are being taken to ensure that pig farmers are not adversely affected due to the closure of the plant. Uh, and the Chair has also asked uh, for details of any health and safety measures planned to ensure that staff in the food processing industry are protected from any potential COVID-19 outbreaks. Members will have noted there's a paragraph on this matter in the table papers at page 28 of the COVID-19 update. So everybody will have seen that and happy enough with that. Chairman, to my knowledge, I think the factory proposes to open tomorrow morning again. I, I, yeah, I'd heard that. Uh, so I had, I had constituents that were in, uh, impacted, uh, pig producers. So uh, one in particular had 150 pigs per week, but he, he couldn't get any this couple of weeks. So it's, it's a big issue for people in the grounds. So. I'm not sure that the has been made public in terms of the opening of it, but it, I, I think it's the hopeful, the hopeful that it will be able to. Uh, can I draw members' attention then just to item 4 on the index sheet that contains uh, a response to issues arising from the meeting on the 1st of July, uh, specifically on how the Department intends to engage with the Committee on Common Frameworks. I'm going to now ask uh, Stella to brief members on this. Yes, it's at page 324 of your main pack members, and it's just it's something that you need to be aware of because we'll be doing a lot of work on Common Frameworks as we, as we move forward. So, um, as we as we said, there's um, the common frameworks are this new um, framework that all the nations will have to act within, whether it's for emissions trading schemes, whether it's for agricultural support, whether it's for animal welfare, whether it's for waste, which will include things like single-use plastic and, and, and domestic waste. So it's massive, massive big policy areas. Now, the, the, the four jurisdictions in Scotland, Wales, are here, and England have been working away on these for the last three years, and we're now coming to the stage where they're almost ready to be finished. 
most of these have to be in place or at least developed enough or to be shortly put in place by the 1st of January. Again, so massive big piece of work coming for the committee. There's a five, there's going to be a five phase approach for Common Frameworks members. Most of the Common Frameworks we're looking at are at phase two. It's when they move to phase three that the parliamentary scrutiny element really kicks in. So the ETS, for example, is at phase three. So that's why we're seeing it now. And we're seeing another one coming through shortly, which is um, radioactive substances. Probably not the most enjoyable of subjects and the most interesting of subjects, but it'll have the work will have to be done there anyway. Um, and then we will hopefully start to see the other ones, the ones that you have more interest in, such as agricultural support, animal health, all those ones will be moving forward and we'll start to see those coming forward between now and Christmas. So that's, that's just to let you know, um, there's some further information there on it and we'll be going through a very similar process once they come through, as has been suggested for the, uh, for the, the, uh, the ETS one. And there'll be other committees working on common frameworks, but this committee will have the most of them. That's all, just, just, just for you to note and be aware of. Thank you. Anybody, any points or questions on that? No. Okay, and just in terms of the correspondence, uh, can I ask members if there's are contempt, just the action, the remainder of the correspondence as suggested uh, on the index sheet? Yep, everybody happy? Yeah. Yep. Okay, we'll move on then to item seven on the CLAR, the forward work programme. Can I refer members just to the draft forward work programme on pages 419 to 424? Uh, members will recall that it was agreed in July that the focus of the committee to Christmas would be on EU exit preparation. And just given their presentation this morning, I think that uh, should still be the case. So it was hoped at this stage that there would be further detail on the actual matters that the committee needs to consider. Uh, we will hear more about this and its impact on the forward pro programme in our closed session. However, it is likely that the committee will need to meet twice weekly on a regular basis from here on. Uh, the first of these twice weekly meetings is likely to be in two weeks and the committee will need today, I suppose, to discuss and agree its options and preference for such additional meetings. Uh, can I also ask the committee to note that although it was hoped that the committee would go back to meeting on Thursday mornings uh, in this room at 10 to 1. That's not guaranteed for a number of reasons. The situation is still to be resolved at assembly management level and the clerk has made it clear that it is the preference of this committee to retain its normal slot of Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. However, this isn't guaranteed. Uh, additional meetings. So when this is necessary and to allow the meeting to broadcast, can I ask members to consider if they would be prepared to meet on Friday mornings? either in Parliament buildings uh, or fully virtually. The other option is for a Monday morning meeting before the plenary starts uh, at 10 to 12. Uh, these are the only time when it is guaranteed that there will be a committee room and broadcasting available. And please note that other committees will likely also be looking at these response options. So Friday or Monday morning seem to be the two options. Cheery news. For our first when, yeah. So the assembly is no longer going to meet on Monday, is that? So the assembly is now meeting two days a week. It'll be meeting Monday and Tuesdays. Tuesdays, okay. Mm -hmm. It's carrying on as normal. It's carrying on as normal. Well, that was when the, yeah, that was okay. That's nice. so. So yeah, we will be here on a Monday morning. But the difficulty with that is, and I'm sure for all the parties, there's group meetings on Monday mornings. Usually yeah. their own party meetings early on Monday morning. Yeah. Difficult time. Yeah. We're not allowed to have committee meetings during plenary, so that means the rest of Monday and Tuesdays are out. And the other committees, all, every, every slot on a Wednesday and Thursday is fully booked, and we're fighting over it. Yeah, but with Friday, <laughs> for Friday for me, it'll have to start late because we have so much on on a Friday. It's, yeah, it's you know, constituency day. day. Know. Once you come here, it's half the day, no matter how, you know, it's an hour for me to travel each way, so it's two hours on the road, so plus a meeting. Ideally, I would have liked to do the second meeting if we had to do it on a Thursday afternoon when you were here, but there's just no rooms. There's already struggling, and not only is there no rooms, there's no broadcasting availability. Is it possible? A lot of the stuff needs to be broadcast. Is it possible to do? Uh, this might sound silly, but is it possible to do the Starlight? You know, 
things that are maybe lesser important on that day that we could... I will try, but I know, for example, and we'll hear about it in the closed session, there will be stuff that will be, you will have to do in public that will be... Okay. Okay. There, there will, I'm there just thinking be, outside the box, yeah, somebody's thinking. Yeah, I know. And that, that was my plan, and I hope that you could do written briefings and things that were correspondence, for example, but that is not necessarily yeah, so that'll, that'll, all that's going to be... save a waste of time in the, in the main meeting, yeah. The, the other thing, Thursday mornings, you said they weren't guaranteed. No. Some of us are at other meetings simply because there happen to be on a Thursday and we're up here, so we'll make use of our time. We're in another meeting, we're allocated another committee also. Which I, is... I, I, have, I have stood on a bit of strong arming and a bit of foot stamping and booked for three meetings, so the 10th and the 7th, today, 10th and 17th. But we are still, we'll have to do week to week yeah. after that. Morris or Patsy, uh, have you any thoughts on the matter? Uh, wait. Well, no, well, uh, Friday morning is difficult. Uh, the constituency day and it's pretty hectic down here, but I would be happy enough to set time aside for Zoom if that helped any. Could I say if we're having them on a Friday morning, they're early on a Friday morning, nine o'clock? Yeah. You get it, yeah, yeah. Okay, so they're clear. Yeah, they'll clear up really quickly, yeah. I would have thought the same. I would have, yeah. I'd say. Uh, Chair, I have recalled from previous experiences where, in fact, the committees did meet during plenaries. Um, I, I do know that that was, I remember uh, working on the uh, mental health capacity ad hoc uh, or um, cross, cross departmental working group uh, committee, sorry, it was. And that did meet during plenaries, and I remember on occasions uh, where previously the economy committee did meet uh, during plenaries. Uh, so it wasn't really as, as cut and dried as that. Uh, I think you just do things as according to how and when you can. You're I don't right. do that. Now, the unfortunate thing is Fridays, Fridays, like a lot of people, if we were going to have a committee meeting that would run on a bit, um, those are the days whenever we have appointments set aside for, for people, so it could be a bit of a... I hadn't missed that one, even whether it's on Starleaf or whatever. Um, I think if we could try and work it around uh, the, the working days at Stormont, if that was at all possible uh, during the rest of the week. Um, I don't know what about Wednesdays, Thursdays, whatever. Whether, whether we do it up there, whether we do it by uh, Starleaf, doesn't really matter to me. But um, the Fridays now would be a wee bit tricky. Uh, uh, Stella has said that the chair or the speaker has made it clear that w we can't do it during uh, plenary sessions. I mean, I, I concur with everything that everybody else has said. I mean, the chair's not here, but my opinion is Friday. No, my Fridays are really busy uh, in the constituency. Yeah, we are all have to be putting ourselves out on our constituents out to do it on a Friday. But I mean, I have preferred to do that if it wasn't a, a long meeting. But I mean, if it was something that was an hour and a half or something, you done it early in the morning, you could probably live with that. But by Starleaf, yeah. Mm -hmm. But oh, you know, if it's at nine o'clock to half ten, you know, and get it over early in the morning. I mean, another possibility. I mean, we're, we're supposed we're, we're not sure about Thursday morning, but this committee started at ten. You no, know, if we were to start this at nine and maybe go on a wee bit longer, you maybe know, you're trying. But, but anyone travelling here, you know, we, we can't go on longer because there's another committee coming in after us. All right. So the room has to be cleaned in between. So we have to be out for one. Um, to allow the room to be cleaned and the other committee to come in and set up. Yeah. But, it, but so I think I think an hour, starting an hour earlier would get an awful lot of work done. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and we could, mm -hmm. I mean, it's important that we do the work that we have to do. The, the work that has to be uh, broadcast, you know, if we could maybe try our best to get the majority of it done. I mean, I'm only making that suggestion. I mean, I would be prepared. I would rather get up an hour earlier to travel here on the Thursday mm -hmm. when I'm coming anyway as opposed to, you know, have an impact on my constituency service on mm -hmm. a Friday. Well, me, earlier in the morning I come, it takes me half an hour longer to come, so it took, I reckon, <laughs> to be here for 9 o'clock, I need to leave at 7.30, you know. And, Rosemary, you belong during the... Oh, well, I don't mind, I don't mind that. It's not the journey, it's not the length of time. I'm happy enough coming for now. Okay. <coughs> well, I will, I will do my best then to try and uh, keep the meetings from 9 o'clock to 1, okay, and... 
when we do need an additional meeting, I'll try and do a virtual one. Okay, yeah. and we'll we'll try as far as early as possible again on on real, on those Fridays. And, and keep them fairly short. Or the things that has to be. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. I mean, it's, I mean, it's the only day left. We don't yeah. have any other. Yeah, exactly. But hopefully, hopefully, it may not have to happen. I'm sure we have oh, to take. It have to happen. Have to happen. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> sure. <laughs> yeah. But if you're waiting from nine to one, there's a four-hour meeting. I think if we could condense to the best we can, and there's meetings that you can get through a lot of work too. You know, yeah. sometimes, sometimes we can. Need the chair to <laughs> correct. Thank you. Okay, so we'll, Stella will come back with uh, that after it's been looked at. So the There's next. There's one additional item in the back of the room. Oh, we're out here. There. All right, sorry. There's an additional item uh, I wish to discuss uh, under this agenda uh, the number of members in room 30. So, as we're aware, we can have six members uh, and the clerk present in the room uh, with all the witnesses appearing by Starley. So, this week it worked out that three members were prepared to attend using Starley. But moving forward, uh, we're looking at that every meeting members maybe indicate if they wish to attend the next meeting by Starleaf or in person. This will enable the committee staff to plan and book rooms as required and allow the committee to respond to change in circumstances. So if members aren't content with that, we would need all our options. It's hard to get a response from everybody about whether they were coming in person or by Starleaf. So. I, mean, I, like, I, prefer I intend to come in, per by, in person. Yeah. Is that me too, Stella? By person, I, yeah, I didn't see him. And the the chair is not here, but he has been attending them all, so I would suggest he obviously has to be. Yeah. And um, Patsy and Morris, are you content to continue attending by Starley? Yeah, I'm happy enough. Uh, but that uh, solved the social distancing solution that I'm happy now. Patsy? Yeah, that's okay. Very good. Okay, we haven't got there. That's well, we'll do our best. Hopefully we'll not end up with one extra member standing outside the door looking <laughs> Okay then, so can I just seek agreement on the forward work programme uh, while acknowledging that it will be subject to rapid change? Everybody yeah. happy? Yeah. Okay, then just moving on to any other business. Uh, and I, I actually have one mm -hmm. item which I'm not sure whether I should raise uh, at this point. But in terms of the COVID fund, uh, I've had a number of uh, farmers on to me just in the last couple of days about proposed changes that they've heard. Uh, with regard to the payment scheme, uh, I actually caught the tail end of it myself on one of the farming programmes in relation to you know, the ownership of our proposed changes in terms of the ownership uh, for the 30 days. So, I, I mean, I was just wondering, because I mean, obviously this committee <laughs> played its part in the consultation process, made its views known, took evidence, uh, went through the SR, and I was a wee bit disappointed that, given that and the role of the committee, that I was hearing of proposed changes on the radio and then being uh, lobbied by farmers. So I mean, can we maybe just get some clarification of what the changes I, are? I asked the question the last day here. You know, I, I was fully aware, and I'm not sure what the proposed changes are because I don't know, but you, you probably know what... Um, Cattle sold in livestock marts to see and then killed by a dealer. Yeah. They proposed to give the payment to the farmer. Yeah. The question I did ask, I have no issue with that, I think that's good. But the question I asked for that was, does that not create a, a it's much more difficult to administrate. There's a lot more, you have to, I would have thought, you know, <coughs> try if you to go to the, the, the slaughterhouses and get a, or also it's very easy to go to Apples and see when the cattle went to the factory. But cattle going to market, they could, there's only a, a small fraction of those would be going on to the factory, so it would be much harder to identify. If you understand, you know, saying there's a thousand cattle in a sale, there might be 50 of those going to the factory, so that, that, I, I did say that it would be much harder to administrate. What is it? What are the proposals? Well, I mean, what, as I say, I just caught the tail end I do. while I was travelling. It seems to be around the ownership of. Uh, 
the cattle at the time of slaughter or you know the length of time that you had to own it. And I think is that not what they agreed with us here? Well, I, 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 I get a clarify this. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I picked it up wrong, but I mean, definitely this week I've had farmers that have been lobbying me, uh, finishers, you know, concerned that they may well use it. So I'm not making any assumption on the, well. the change is good or bad. Yeah. Just the fact that it seems to be the case that there's a change that the committee wasn't notified about. Uh, I think at one stage they, they had intended not paying to those. I, 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 I what I got early on in the in the situation, but because it is diffi- it is quite difficult to administrate. You understand because the small numbers of cattle that actually go to livestock marts that go on in the factory, they wouldn't be large numbers. But the you know it can be done. I'm not quite sure, but I did ask the question if you recall. Is that not much more difficult to administrate? But can I can I just I mean, maybe yeah, I ask Della to seek clarification yeah, on it, yeah. and if need be, then m- maybe the chair. If there is an issue as a result of that clarification, maybe the chair then might need to write to the minister in relation to it. Yeah, well, the committee has signed up on the SL1, but not the SR yet. Okay, fair enough. So, it's I... still to come. Okay, uh, anybody, any other items of business? Fair enough. Then, date, time, and uh, of our next meeting is. Uh, Thursday the 10th of September at 10 a.m. in this room. So. And then we have one wee bit of item to discuss and close business. Okay, fair enough. So we're just going to now move on to close okay. business then? Yes, if you just have broadcasting, we'll remove all witnesses, make sure it's just members, okay. all members in the spotlight. Yeah. Can I just ask broadcasting before we move on to close uh, business t- to make sure there's just all members uh, to the spotlight and remove any witnesses? Oh, there's Claire back. Good. Okay, so we've got Claire back, and we're now going to move on to uh, close business. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.